Outside Health and Fitness, and welcome to episode number four of the Best Life Show. I am so stressed about tonight's show, I'm thinking about pulling my hair out, but uh, whatever. I'm joined by my co-host, Jessica Bailey from Sassy Girl Fitness. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi. I'm so glad that we're finally connecting, and I am so glad that we have tonight's episode because, hmm, you know. Yeah, there's some things in my life that I need to talk about. Yeah, we'll have to talk about all the all the things that we get stressed out about sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm really excited. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, we are really honored to have Dr. Kathy Gruber with us on the show today. And Dr. Kathy is an award-winning author. She's a speaker, guest expert, and an educator. She earned her PhD in natural health and has been featured as an expert in a whole bunch of different publications from Glamour, Fitness, Time, The Wall Street Journal, Prevention, and a whole bunch more. Uh, she recently turned her award-winning book, The Alternative Medicine Cabinet, into a national talk show, and we're really excited to have her on the show. Welcome to the Best Life Show, Dr. Kathy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks for taking the time. Of course. So, can you tell us, we're going to talk all about uh, stress tonight, and we've all experienced it, but maybe we don't really know what it is. Can you kind of explain what stress is? Yeah, absolutely. The, the textbook definition of stress is a perception that demands are going to exceed our resources. It's a threat, real or imagined. And what's so fascinating about our stress now is those keywords of perception and imagined. You know, it used to be that um, we'd have a bear chasing us and we'd have this very specific fight or flight response. Well, today we don't have a bear chasing us but we're still having that fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a rise in blood pressure and we're seeing um, our cognitive function decline, our digestive, uh, digestive issues, sexual response problems, because when you're being chased by a bear, you don't have to do complicated math. You're not digesting your food. You're not interested in making love. Um, you're there specifically to defend yourself or to curl up in a ball and hide. So the stress that we're getting now is eliciting that same response, but we don't have anything to do with it. We don't need it. So that's where stress is becoming a problem. Is it's it's hitting us with things that we can't we can't handle right now. Right, and it's and like you said, it's a lot of it's kind of we make it up ourselves. It's our perception of what's happening. Uh huh. So, Dr. Kathy, how is stress affecting, like, our everyday health? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I just said, I mean, we're kind of walking around in this heightened stress response. So, when the bear was chasing us, we would have this peak of stress, and then we'd relax after the bear left. Hopefully, we weren't eaten. Um, after the bear left, we would relax, and all those hormones would return to normal. Well, now our stress isn't this dynamic, short-lived thing of a bear coming after us. It's the IRS, and it's the job loss, and it's the foreclosure, and it's the kid on drugs, and it's the mother-in-law has Alzheimer's, and the kid's on drugs, and one day the bacon catches on fire, and we absolutely lose our minds because there's this constant low-level stress that doesn't peak and then go away. Um, and so that's affecting our immune system at first during stress our immune system heightens but then over time it gets completely beaten down and I have so many clients who finally get to take that vacation right and what happens they're sick the entire time it's not the airplane it's not the food poisoning it's the fact that your immune system finally went oh thank god the battles over I I can't handle it anymore and you end up getting ill um, memory decline and cognitive function issues you know so many of us are walking around basically hypnotized because we're so overstressed and so we're susceptible to all these negative suggestions and all this overwhelming thought and um, it's affecting our mental health it's affecting our physical health so many diseases are linked to stress and about 60 to 80 percent of our doctors visits are from stress related illness it's a huge amount and since we can't control stress we can only control our reaction to it, and that's that's the easy part because we have control over that. Wow, it makes so much sense. And, I mean, we all know that we shouldn't be stressed. So, God, thank you for telling us. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear a lot about people, you know, will we'll deal with that. They'll do meditation or something like that. Are there other things that we can do in terms of, um, maybe just our thinking patterns when we are in a stressful situation? Yeah, absolutely. It's estimated we have about 60,000 thoughts a day, and that 50,000 of those are negative. 
that's a lot of negative thoughts. Um, that's one thing we can control. You know, we can't control these external things. We can't always control our emotions. I have people say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this. It's like, well, but you can't stop that. What you can change is how you think about it, your perception of it, how you're verbalizing these things. Um, so one of the things I really like is affirmations. You know, it's hard to stop thinking things. So to stop thinking these 50,000 negative thoughts, that's, that's really hard. And people feel like they fail and they're not doing it right. Affirmations are simple. Turn it into something positive. Make them short, make them in the present, make them positive. So rather than people freaking out about cold and flu season, oh, I hope I don't get sick. Oh, geez, I think I'm getting sick. Oh, don't get near me, you'll get me sick. We're just depleting our immune system at that point. That stress is not helping us. So say something like, I am healthy and well. My immune system is strong and resilient. That actually, at the very least, stops those negative thoughts. But also, we can actually boost our immune system by programming our minds and thinking things like that. Um, one of the other things, one of my mother's favorite phrases was, more hurry, less speed. And we've all had that experience where we're rushing to get something done because we don't think we have enough time, and that's when the coffee spills on the keyboard, and that's when we knock over the plant, and you know it ends up not being efficient for us. So I like to say, I have plenty of time. It doesn't manufacture time. I don't, I don't think, uh, but what it does is it slows us down, brings us back to the present moment so that we can do what we're doing with focus and purpose as opposed to being a total spaz, and I've been there, um, did it this morning, grabbed the key so fast, I pulled the key thing right off the wall, then I had to stop, I had to put the key thing back, you know, the, the two seconds that I saved from rushing were completely negated by the 10 seconds it took me to put the keys back on. So um, saying I have plenty of time and taking a deep breath, inhale, exhale, fabulous. And you can do affirmations with anything. I am surrounded by helpful and loving friends. I am prosperous and abundant. My job is productive and successful. Any of those things work and they change those negative thoughts. That's great. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's nice because it's something that we have some control over. Yep, and no prescription necessary. It's totally free. There's no bizarre side effects. You're not going to fall asleep while you're driving. You know, it's like, it's 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 something that we can do. And stress is this feeling of being hopeless and helpless. It's a feeling of being out of control. So when we do things like affirmations or meditation or visualization, those give us some semblance of control. And right off the bat, it automatically helps us feel better. Nice. Oh. So for those that can't meditate, how does visualization work? For those of us that can't meditate, that would be me, terrible at meditation. I'm very type A. Um, I dance. I do flying trapeze. I walk fast. I talk fast. I eat fast. I'm a triple Capricorn only child, control freak. Don't tell me to sit on a pillow and stop moving my body and my mind. I'm terrible at it. I will be the first to admit. Um, so what I discovered, and I'll, I'll get to visualization in a second, but I want to talk about these mini meditations because they're phenomenal. Um, it's so simple. You inhale and think, I am. Exhale, think, at peace and just repeat it. Inhale, I am. Exhale at peace. And if other thoughts break through, which inevitably they do, um, just return to your breath and go back to I am at peace. Dismiss those thoughts. Don't judge it. You're not doing it wrong. It's not a failure. It just, I'm thinking, it moves through. And you return to that. And I have found so many people who, like me, can't meditate and feel like they should be meditating or they should be doing yoga. And I'm like, but if those don't work for you, why should you be doing them? You know, um, just because your aunt said you, she read on you know some magazine that that everybody should be doing yoga, that's not true. We have to customize these things for what works for us. The I am at peace works for anybody. I've taught them to children. I've taught them to 911 dispatchers. I'm working on a project for the for the military right now. Anybody can do this, and you can do it anytime, any place. Stops that stress response. So for someone that can't meditate, that's what I suggest. Anybody can do this. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so, now you said you were going to get to some visualizations, too. Yeah, visualizing is one of my most favorite things. I learned to visualize when I was about 15 years old. I was in a summer stock production of Oklahoma. I used to be an actress, and I was starting to feel sick. I had that little tickle in my throat that is my tell that something's going awry. And we were opening that week, and I was freaking out that I was going to lose my voice and not be able to have my big stage debut. Um, and I'm sitting there at rehearsal, and I've got my big thing of tea and the lemon and the honey, and I'm kind of... <clears throat> 
<laughs> you know, doing this thing. And this other cast member walks up to me and he says, are, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm starting to feel sick and my throat hurts. And I, uh, and he goes, oh, okay, well, you know, do you ever visualize? And I just looked at him thinking, I'm 15. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what, what does it even mean? And he said, oh, that's okay. Um, well, do you daydream? And I said, yes. I said, that I do. And I'm an only child, so I can talk to myself, too, if you need me to do that. And he goes, okay, perfect. He said, so I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to visualize your immune system. And again, I must have looked at him like he was nuts, because what the hell does that mean, visualize my immune system? And he said, I want you to picture the space behind your heart. That's your thymus gland, and that produces so, many, so much of our immune function. I went, okay. He said, and picture those white blood cells, like white light, rushing into your throat, and like the cavalry coming over the hill at the end of that movie, it battles the bacteria, the virus, it wins the fight, it eradicates all that bacteria, and you feel great. And I went, okay. So I got home that night, and I kind of put my hands on my throat, and I'm laying in bed, and I pictured this white blood cells rushing up into my throat, and it was this cool feeling, and then I pictured the cavalry coming down over the hill and flooding into my throat, and there was horses and swords and dogs, and I mean, there was all sorts of things going on. And I fell asleep in the midst of this elaborate film, and um, I woke up the next day, and I was not sick, and my throat did not hurt. I was brilliant in Oklahoma, <laughs> and um, I've been visualizing since. And when I was working on my dissertation for my PhD, I found all this phenomenal research about how powerful visualization is. We can speed wound healing. We can fix bone breaks quicker. T there's evidence that tumors have shrunk, um, that pain decreases. We can lower our blood pressure and our heart rate. And, you know, there's so many things that we can do simply by visualizing. And th our brain is as powerful as it is. You know, we create this kind of technology where we're speaking to each other, to the world, across the country, and it it's amazing to me. The fault of our brain is that it doesn't know the difference between what we're thinking about and imagining and what's actually happening to us. So if I had everybody listening think about the most horrible experience you've ever had and don't do it, you're going to put yourself back into a stress response. So when we're dwelling on these negative things from the past and when we're worrying about and imagining these horrible things in the future, our body has a stress reaction to that. It's hard enough that we've got all this stress bombarded from outside of ourselves. We're creating our own in these thoughts and these memories and these, these feelings that we're dredging up and reliving over and over again. So in the same way, we can visualize positive things. And one of the best ways to decrease pain is to visualize a nature scene and really get your senses involved. Maybe the beach is your thing. So you picture yourself standing on the beach and you're digging your toes in the cool sand and the water laps up over your feet and you can hear the sound of the waves whooshing onto the shore and there's a gull up at the distance and you feel the sun beating down on your face and you lick your lips and feel, taste that little bit of salt air on your mouth. You do that for five minutes, your stress response is gone, your pain levels drop, you're ready to function. And it's the same thing with the mini meditations, it's the same thing with the affirmations. We can change our physiology by what we're thinking about, by what we're talking about. It's so powerful and we haven't even begun to tap into this for healing. It's, it, it's the next big thing, <laughs> I hope. I hope it is. Wow, I can't wait to try this. This sounds so <laughs> exciting and amazing and as soon as we hang up, I'm doing it. Okay, cool. Beach. I sorry, went off there for a second. I'm like all <laughs> over the beach. Um. <laughs> you know, you you said one thing there that reminded me of um, when we spoke before. Uh, you said something that was very impressive to me, and that was that a lot of stress uh, happens in the past or it happens in the future, and it's a lot about just being present. Right? Can you talk about that for a sec? Yeah, absolutely. And 2014 was deemed the year of mindfulness. And now that we're in 2015, which I also can't even believe, um, I don't know what this year is going to be deemed, but I hope it's something just as good. And when people hear the word mindfulness, they think that's meditation. And you, there is certainly mindful meditation, and there's mindfulness practices separate from meditation. And being mindful is simply going about an activity with focus and purpose and curiosity. So you can do anything mindfully. And I had the privilege of studying with Thich Nhat Hanh, who, amazing, the man walked on stage and I thought, how do they light him like that? And then I realized, no, no, that's that's just him. <laughs> he, just, he just glows from within. Now, if I was living in a monastery where I didn't have traffic and taxes and housework, I'd probably be floating a little bit more too. Um, but what is so great is 
anybody can take a little piece of what his life is and bring it into your own life. And for people that have said to me, I don't have time to meditate, or I can't meditate, or I don't believe in this visualization crap, okay, cool, whatever. Find something that works. And the mindfulness stuff, you can mindfully do the dishes. You can mindfully brush your teeth. You can mindfully make love. You can mindfully take a shower. You can mindfully clean the cat box. Um, and if you're doing the dishes, you know, incorporate all your senses and look at this with curiosity. How does the water feel on your hands? How's the temperature of it? What does it feel like on your skin? Is it hard water? Is it soft? You put the soap in. You smell that lemon. Really smell that. And then the bubbles start to form. And one little bubble floats away. And then it pops. And there's this little spray of water. And as you're doing the dishes, feel the plate. Is it rough? Did you miss a spot? You know, Suddenly, 20 minutes has gone by. And you've got a kitchen full of clean dishes. And you basically meditated for 20 minutes. It brings you back into the present moment. It's a distraction, but it's a focused distraction. And this is one of the things that's so great about exercise. Um, if you fully get into what you're doing, you know, when I do flying trapeze, I can't think about anything other than flying trapeze. Because if I do, I'm going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be in the present moment, ready for your calls, whether it's a tennis ball coming at you or a football being thrown or the, you know, getting into an activity like that. And that's one of the good things about yoga, if you're doing it with a spiritual component to it, is there is that focus of breathing into the pose, feeling what your body is doing, and really staying in the moment. Because it's right. I mean, where is the stress? You know, it's not right here. Um, it's behind us or it's in front of us, things that we can't change from the past and things that we worry about from the future that we're not even sure is going to happen. And one of my clients said something very wise. He said, if you have one foot in the past and one foot in the future, you end up pissing all over the present. And that's really true because the only thing we have is right now. Um, and why are we peeing on that? <laughs> you know, it's like we only have this moment right now and now that moment's gone. And with every exhale, we have the ability to create another moment and make a different choice and make a change and that to me is the power of being human is we have these choices and these options and we just have to exercise them yeah that's awesome that's great and and I'm gonna have to quote that you know peeing on the present thing that's just yeah you know, maybe that'd be the it's title perfect. of the I mean, post yeah there you go <laughs> why are you peeing on the present yeah. that might get an audience that you don't want to have <laughs> no probably not very true so Kathy Dr. Kathy does nutrition have anything to do with stress like the way I eat, can I stop the stress? Well, you can't stop the stress, but here's another example of things that are in or out of our control. We can't control most of the external things. We can control what we're putting in our body. And there are foods that are going to contribute to the stress in our body. And when we think of stress, we think of the traffic and you know these sort of um, more psychological, emotional stressors. But we have to remember physical stress, too, um, whether that's exercise is physical stress. Frankly, the most stressful thing you're going to do every day is waking up and getting out of bed because you're going from a completely calm state to a motivated state. That's actually stressful on the body, but we don't think about that. Um, dealing with the physical stressors around us, whether that's air pollution, whether that's additives in our food, whether that's artificial sweetener, high fructose corn syrup, GMOs, that is all putting stress on our body. So anything we can do to put the most pure and healthy things in our body that's the best thing we can do. Realistically, some of that's out of our control too. They don't label MSG. GMOs don't have to be labeled. Um, we're being surrounded by pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. What I advise people to do is make the best choices you can. And I'm a realist. I'm very practical. I also don't believe in denying myself. I don't think that's a healthy way of being. Um, so I go with the 80-20 rule. And you know, 80% of the time, do the best you can. 20% of the time, maybe you're traveling and your only choice is a fast food restaurant. Or you really do want the donut on donut day. Or um, I really avoid GMOs and high fructose corn syrup, artificial sweetener. I'm pretty militant about those things. However, occasionally I'm at a restaurant. I get hash browns or french fries or that sort of thing. I want ketchup. I know the ketchup has high fructose corn syrup, which I know is genetically modified. For as little as I have that, if I make the conscious choice of, you know, today I'm having the ketchup, got my dose of GMOs, it's not going to kill me. 
we have to be smart with our choices and we have to know we have choices and I think when we deny ourselves things and we try to be this militant 100 percent I think it's really bad because we're just setting ourselves up to fail um, now you don't want to swing to the other extreme either where you give in to every little whim you have because typically those whims aren't the best choices you know if we're feeling depressed if we're feeling down and we want comfort food I don't know anybody that says oh if I only had a bowl of broccoli you know we want the we want the gooey stuff with the mashed potatoes and the macaroni and cheese and the, you know, we want those feel-good carbs. We don't say, gosh, if I only had a stock of celery. <laughs> you know, we don't, that's not our comfort food. Um, so give in, have the macaroni and cheese occasionally, but be conscious of it. Um, I had a client who was very, very lactose intolerant. Like, I mean, she could not have a chunk of cheese without being socially unacceptable. And we were out to lunch one day and she got blue cheese on her salad. And I looked at her and I said, I, I thought you couldn't have cheese because it made you so, you know. And she said, you know what? She said, I had the testing done. I found out I was, I had problems with the cheese. I'll get a headache later. She said, but you know what? I really love cheese. She said, so every once in a while, being very conscious of what it's going to do to me, I choose to have the cheese. I deal with the headache for a day. She said, that's the choice I'm making. And I said, good for you. You know, she knew what it was going to do. She was consciously making that decision. And cool. You know, she went into it knowing what it was going to do to her. More power to her. <laughs> I like that 80-20 rule. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to start doing it. I was on a I was on a radio show with a gal who was really trying to goad me into radical statements. Um, she was kind of really pushing that I'm anti-GMO, but she was really pushing this very divisive, militant GMO thing. And, you know, I told her about my 80-20 thing, and she said, I'm 100%. Oh. And I said, that sounds awful. And I could just hear this dead silence on the other end of the phone. And I said, she was a vegan. She did CrossFit. She, and I had a visual of what this woman looked like. And she sounded miserable. And I said, you know, I dance four days a week. I said, I'm a very conscious meat eater. Um, and these movies that portray meat eaters as these fat slobs with the high cholesterol who are at McDonald's five yeah. times a day. I'm not that meat eater. My husband and I are very conscious meat eaters. I think if that's your metabolism, I can't be a vegan or vegetarian. It is completely unhealthy for my body. Um, but she just sounded like she had such a struggle to be 100% that she had to show off that she was 100%. And I'm thinking, you want a donut. I can tell you want a donut so bad, or you want a piece of steak, or you want something off your mm. diet. You know, She just sounded miserable, and it's completely... I think it's completely unreasonable to expect someone to do something 100%. I, I believe that, you know, and if I'm sure there are people out there shaking their head going, no, I'm 100% too. Cool. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for 90% of the population. I'm a realist. I'm a down-to-earth Capricorn, and that's what I have to go with. <laughs> well, I think 100% being 100% uh, committed to something is unrealistic. Like how, as a person, you cannot be 100% committed to anything. Right. I mean, maybe a little, maybe you have, like, the goal of being 100%, but you don't, like, be a crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> just decide. Yeah. <aside>, you're... <laughs> This yeah, it be was one of the a little. It causes you some stress too if you're trying to be. Well, it, exactly, exactly. And like I said, you can't swing to the opposite extreme either. And there's a restaurant out here on the West Coast called Tommy Burger, and they make the such good chili cheeseburgers. I know it's probably cruddy meat, and I'm sure it's not the best thing. But every once in a while, I very consciously choose. Typically after a day of trapeze, because I know I worked off the calories, I will choose to stop at Tommy's and I will have a single cheeseburger with chili. Okay, I'm choosing to do that. And a couple times ago when I was in there, this, fa this these women walked in and they were so obese. I mean, it broke my heart. They could barely walk. They just sort of shuffled in and every single one ordered a double cheeseburger with chili, french fries with chili, and the largest soda they could. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not saying that they should deny themselves, but my God, did you ever think to get just the single hamburger like I did? Or to get water instead of soda? Or to not have three french fries with the chili and the cheese? Um, they got the most extreme meal they could in that restaurant. And they, I'm sure, sat down and devoured it. I left. I couldn't. <laughs> I had to go. Um, but we have to know there's options. And to not be 100% doesn't mean you have to be 0% either. And, you know, these women each had enough calories for what 
in one meal what I would have probably in two days because that was their treat. They felt like they deserved it. I don't know what the psychology was behind it, but watching what they ordered broke my heart because I don't think they realized they could still enjoy that meal but not blow it out of proportion like that. Right. You know, we, um, we like to come up with a, something that the audience can take away. Um, and you've given us a lot of stuff here, um, but if we had to kind of pare it down to, you know, one simple easy thing that, that you could do that you feel would have a big impact on, on somebody long term, what, what kind of advice would you give for that? Make the choice. Um, like I said, with every minute, we have a choice to make, and it's the choice of a single Tommy burger or a double Tommy burger with fries and chili and soda. Um, we have that totally in our control. There's always another option, and with every breath, there's another option. Um, to be closer to that 100% or that 90%, we have options of seeing another physician, of asking more questions, of saying, this pill isn't working for me, do you have something else? We have to exercise those options and know we have them. And I always say this, I've lost several friends and clients to suicide. And what makes me so sad about that is they sat in that moment at that time and didn't think anything would ever change. And I'm here to tell you, we have an option. They might not be your ideal options. It might not be the best option you think you have, but we have them. And just moving that one, that, that piece one step closer to that option then gives you more options. So exercise control of that. And if that doesn't work, think inhale, I am, exhale at peace because that always does it. Nice. That's awesome. And it, it is. It's very comforting to know that you are you have some control. You have options. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's awesome advice. Is there anything else you want to share? Oh, I, I just shared so much. No, um, you, guys are, <laughs> you guys are awesome. And, you know, go, go check out my website. I've got so many free resources there, and I've got my book mm -hmm. on stress and my book on health, and um, I offer weekend coaching and, and customized visualizations for people, and there's a lot of good resources there. So check it out. Sign it for my newsletter. Let me know how I can help. That's so great. exciting. So our next show is February 4th, and that is a Wednesday. It's at 8 p.m. with Kevin Smullen. And I'm very excited because he's a certified clinical hypnotherapist. And I, I'm very excited to talk to him because I've only had one terrible experience, and I want to find out what it really should be like. And he helps frustrated people who want to make a change in their life but don't know how. Okay. Great, right? That sounds good. I know. Uh -huh. I know. that This is so exciting because there's so many people that can help me change for the better. <laughs> and, I want, and I get to talk to them. That's right. So be sure to follow us on social media and never miss a live event or a show. So go to bestlifeshow.com forward slash follow and connect with us on your favorite social network. And That's while awesome. you're there, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter. Still free? Uh, yeah, it's still free. <laughs> don't worry. It's That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. 100% free. 100%. Um, There's a one thing that's 100%. I know. Right. Can you believe it? Dr. I know. Kathy, love thank, thank you so much. And I'll make sure we put uh, some links in the show notes so people can come visit you as well. Oh, perfect. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been great to, great to be on. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kathy, for being here with us. And thank you, Steve, for having a wonderful conversation with Dr. Kathy and I. Sounds great. We'll see you later. Thanks for living your best life.